At the time, no one had managed a TikToker before. It was a really new concept. Meet Hannah Holland, founder and CEO of HLD Talent. She's here to spill insider secrets on how to dominate the digital, podcast, and broadcast space. I'd love to get to the Chris Jenner level. Just because someone's got 100,000 followers doesn't mean they need a manager. Sometimes people are too quick to leave their full-time jobs just to say that they're an influencer. You people think anyone could do it too. And I'm here to tell you they cannot. It's very competitive. Every year, the value of social media marketing and digital marketing increases. For us, it's very much a case of, is there a need? Can we be additive to your career? That's so important. I love the hustle that comes with it to get to the end result. For wannabe influencers, what advice would you give them? Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm an executive headhunter, career coach, and host of the show. Here, we talk about how to find your calling, how to succeed in business, and how to live well whilst doing so. I am bringing Anatomy of a Leader live to a venue in London. If you'd like to be the first to find out about it, please make sure that you follow the link in the show notes to be added to the waitlist. And don't forget to subscribe or follow the show wherever you're listening. Hannah. Hi. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you. I know. It's, um, it's always bizarre you meet someone for the first time and I you get straight into it. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's unusual for me in the sense that at least frequently I have more interaction or maybe if I, I know the guest mm. so here it's like completely like not spoken with you like yeah. com f completely from yeah nice to meet you nice to meet you <laughs> <laughs> well for those people who don't know you what mm. would be great is if you can give a very quick two minute sort of early years background mm. into who you are and how you started Yes, yeah, so my name is Hannah Holland. I'm the CEO and founder of HLD Talent. Uh, HLD Talent is a predominantly female talent management agency. We also, we do have a couple of male talent that we have as well. We're female founded, female run, and a little bit of background. So I went to university, I dropped out because I'm sassy. And um, <laughs> no, it was a bit more to that, but I dropped out and I started working for a magazine who then started managing talent from that magazine. And I primarily did that job and when they shut it down I started my own and we've kind of been building it up ever since and you know really noticed there's a niche in the market for female talent and having I guess a female voice behind those talent it's a when I started talent management was predominantly quite a male industry but it, it's not quite the same like that anymore it's more women coming in and dominating the industry which is really incredible to see mm -hmm. I'm going to come back on the female talent side because this is a passion of mine Ugh. but going back to the bit that you said about being sassy I am sassy <laughs> tell me about that so in school yeah I was how, how did I was sass naughty. I was a naughty girl at school were you yeah like what like how I got excluded. <laughs> I was excluded a couple of times. I just like had rebelled. Right. I was quite rebellious. I never could just accept what someone told me to do. I always had something to say. I was just, you know, I think my parents would very much just say, sometimes you can just shut up. And I'd be like, no, I stand up for my rights. I don't have rights. I was a child at school. They weren't <laughs> asking me to do anything outrageous. But that was just sort of who I was. And I think that's how I've always built myself up that you know if it doesn't if it doesn't feel right I can't just go along with it what were you rebelling against life I don't know who knows I, I was so young I was like in secondary school um I think yeah I think you know when you're a child you everything hits a bit harder especially when you're a young woman I think so many hormones and you're just you know I, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily, I think, go to school in, in these days because I think everyone's really harsh. I think body image has always been a big part of schooling and, you know, comparing how much, like, yeah, have you got the new handbag? And, you know, in my school, it was like, who had the car first and things like that. And obviously I was ginger at school. Like, people weren't very nice to me all the time. So it is just one of those ones where maybe that's what I was rebelling because I was bullied. It's like asserting yourself. Yeah, I think... I always, I think, I think, I, I speak about it quite often with my team. I, when I started the business, I think the intentions I had were, were different in terms of I really wanted to prove everyone wrong because I was bullied quite heavily at school. But now I, it's just completely different. I always think, I wish I could go back and tell my younger self, like, just keep being you. Like, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. Being different is cool. Mm. My whole personal brand is based on my hair colour. And that's why I was bullied. So... 
you know but people like bully people for just like anything that's different about anyone if you've got like a different color eye color or hair color it's just like it's just an easy pickings Mm. I love how you're saying that your brand is built on the one thing that you got bullied for yeah it's like lean into your self like lean into your strengths and what you've got well most people can see my hair before they see anything else like you can (laughs) my friends always say it's so easy to spot me in a crowd you know because I do step like my hair does stand out or we've had it before with clients. I've been with clients and they're like, when they're trying to find them, they're like, oh, I found your hair and sort of headed towards it. <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, I'm like a traffic light at this point. It's mm-hmm. actually, getting, as I get older, I've actually, I'm making it redder and redder. You know, before I used to want to blend in, I dyed my hair black when I was younger. And now I just really want to stand out more, apparently. Mm. So talk me through the point where you've decided to start your business. What prompted you to do that? Anything specific happen or is it something that you've been thinking about for a while? So when I started HOD, I I worked for a magazine that doesn't actually exist anymore called, it was called 66 Magazine. And it was a female, um, I call it like high fashion nudity, it was quite nude. But it was, I worked in a really cool industry of, it was back, back when I started in 2019. So I started in the industry like 2016, 2017 glamour and sexiness was like the selling point you know page three girls were dominating the industry they were the ones going on reality tv shows and it was a completely different um demographic to now and you know that's when like zoo and all those fhm those big publications were dominating everything and so i worked uh, for them and they also had their own version of like babe station and i actually really loved working in that environment i felt so proud to be part of it because it's it's spending time with women that usually are quite heavily judged and you get to know them they're absolutely incredible women and they're the kind some of the kindest people I've ever met and they they are hustlers they work hard and they're so driven and it was uh, an industry that I was just excited to be part of and it, it just was a different time it's hard to really explain now because when I say it to maybe some of the younger generation they're like what do you mean like and I'm like if you're part of it it was very hustle and bustle and it was like we did these glamorous shoots and making women feel really empowered and uh, strong was so important to me and then they started managing talent and um, so they had Demi Rose and they took on Megan Barton Hansen and I got to be part of that those sorts that side of the industry and I was I really, really enjoyed it, and I really felt passionate towards it. Um, I started as Demi Rose's PA and then kind of worked my way up. And But, you know, I, I wanted to make more money. I was always driven. I always knew I, I didn't want to have a boss. I've always, you know, rebelled against being told what to do, apparently. Um, you know, I, I don't like being told what to do. I'll be really honest about it. And um, so I started the agency like very small and I just started doing micro influencers I started making like an extra few thousand pounds here and there and I was like damn I'm actually pretty good because these talent these talent only had like five thousand six thousand followers and I was you know leaning into understanding the importance of micro influencers different size influencers and you know the selling power and actually there's this whole new world out there and when they decided to shut down that side of the that the agency and focus in a different direction I said I wanted to leave and you know I wanted to continue that that side of the business and Demi came with me and um, because I'd been with her for quite a few years and yeah we sort of went from there and we've really kind of continued since then and been really strong and one of the things we've always tried to keep to you know the culture that we've built which is you know women supporting women and bringing women up within this industry it's also a very isolating industry the entertainment space and it can be really scary when you're really thrown in the deep end and all of a sudden you've gone from no one really knows who you are to everyone knows who you are that's really intimidating and scary you need to feel like you've got someone on your side and it's not just someone who wants to hammer you for cash because that's not what a manager should, manager should be a manager should be your number one fan it should be your biggest supporter someone who really believes in you and you are one one team and I think that's where I felt really different about being a boutique agency that was kind of building up there. But now obviously we're bigger than a boutique agency and we're building slowly and we're competing with some big giants in the space, which is for me really exciting. And it's always scary, but if you're scared, it means you're on the right path. That's true. So what do you think made you successful in the early days when you said, oh, well, I was working with these micro influencers and I was making extra cash? Like what about you or what specific things were you doing that brought you that success 
So my mum has always been like a powerful woman. So my mum was director of Events Cancer Research UK. She was part of the founding team of Race for Life. And so I've just always grown up with this really strong fe- female figure in my life who's really pushed me to be the best version of myself, be, be my authentic self, but also be very purpose-driven of, you know, what is the reason that you want to do these things? And I think... You know, I've, I've just always wanted to do more. I like even when I was at university, I worked full time. When I was, uh, I used to work at Debenhams, like in between school and university, because I had a few years out. And I also worked at, well, I worked at Debenhams in the day and night. I then worked till like three a.m. at Yates in Croydon. You know, it was a very as you do, as you do. <laughs> but I always wanted to, you know, hustle and make money. I don't like sitting still. I get very agitated. So it was just something that I really wanted to challenge myself on because. I realised that I loved what being a talent manager and what it entailed and seeing a talent grow and seeing a partnership form between a brand and a talent. So I just started challenging myself because there was only so much I could do when I worked for the other agency because they were so small. So you only had um, a very specific amount you could do because you had talent with very specific strategies. And I wanted to explore different sides of the business and one of the things I've learned is so important strategies, but at the time I was 23. So, you know, I was very explorative and I really wanted to get to get into the nitty gritty of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I learned very quickly how much time and effort and energy it takes to start a business. And when you're young, I think you have this real driving force behind you. You're not scared of anything. You know, you see it in children all the time, like they're willing to just throw themselves in, in, off, building not building but you know what I mean like throw themselves around and you know when you get older you all of a sudden, all of a sudden there's fear and I didn't have that back then so mm-hmm. it's you know I think that's kind of what really drove me because I thought actually worst comes to worst it all falls apart and go get another job so you don't know what you don't know or sometimes being a bit naive and ignorant to it is a is an incredible thing because yeah. no one can no one could put a downer on it. And and even if they did at the time, I was just so like blinkers on. I was like, no, I'm going to make this a success. It's going to be yeah. incredible. And that's the one thing about me is like, when I set my mind to it, it, I can't fail. And I will not let myself fail. It's interesting. A lot of founders talk about the power of naivety, where if you had known how hard it was going to be, you probably wouldn't have started in the first I know. place. <laughs> and I'm reading, I've just finished reading the book by Phil Knight, who is the co-founder of Nike. Mm. And this book is just so anxiety inducing. And so like I was reading it, and I was like, if anyone ever wants to start a business, like don't read this book. Oof. It's, it's, it's like everything goes wrong. It's like the amount of drama, challenges, struggles, difficulties. It's like it's better not to know when you're starting. Yeah. So many, many founders say the same thing. I think it's, it's different as well if you're in a service-led business or a product-led business. Obviously, I know there's different challenges they would have in terms of like stock. And I was, when I read, um, I re- read, um, the, oh, I can't remember, I can't pronounce her name oh I know who you mean the founder of Rodeo Rodeo Hertz Hertz Stefanis yes something like that well it's um yeah it's like over like overnight success or something Uh, I can't remember the exact name yeah and the first sentence is like I think I'm gonna go bankrupt and I'm like oh god it's just intense to read and you know the stress of you know to sell and make all that money you have to kind of have a big cash flow to begin with to then buy all that stock in and you know then you've got to send it all out and you know you hear I when I speak to certain brands and someone we're really really collaborative with they were like you know it costs this much to kind of already just to send it straight to say Sainsbury's or whatnot and these are the import fees etc etc and you're going they're not issues that I obviously have that you know we're very service based so I think in some retrospect I can't necessarily relate you know the when I started, the, the, the pressures I had was getting new talent and having talent believe in me when I was so young myself and not, I didn't have 20 years of experience behind me, but I had a drive and a passion like that I felt that no one else had at that time. Mm. And How I, did you convince people to believe in you? I, th- I think it was a case that I believed in them. And I think that's really important as a talent manager that the that your drive is how much you believe that they can succeed and what they have to offer that is different to everyone else in their space and you're willing to go through every high and low with them to get there. Because, you know, there's many a no in this industry. It's, it's quite cutthroat. And 
my my job is to shield, protect, build and learn and move on with that talent. And I think that was something that I was quite naive at the time to not realise that actually you had to I had I didn't have as many contacts as I had now, but I've 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 learned the hard way, but I think that's why now I feel like I'm a lot better at my job. Well, I think I'm very good at my job to be honest. I love what I do and I think no one can take that away from you when you have an undoubted self-belief in what you can do for someone. And I think for me, that's what I've done with Grace, who I manage, is I've always, I've just believe, believed in her from the day I met her and I know she's incredible. And the same belief I had then, I have it even more now. And I know where she's going to be. And I love being part of that journey and watching her really succeed. Mm. So using Grace as an example, how did you select her and how did you approach her? Oh, it's a really fun story, this one. I like this one. Um, so my friend kept sending me videos of her on TikTok and she was like, this girl is literally you. And it was like, the video is, um, I, need to, I need to send it to you. It's so funny. It's like, you know, when you know you're going to go for brunch with someone you don't like, it's like, I'll wipe the floor with you. And then <laughs> and then you see them go, oh my God, hi, babe, nice to see you. <laughs> and it was just so funny. And she had so many great videos. Mm-hmm. And at the time, no one had managed a TikToker before. It was a really new concept because um, it was a new platform you know no and it also the way, the way that you can now sell on tiktok they, that didn't exist when we took on grace so i sort of messaged her and just said i want to be your manager or your best friend and um yeah so it, it worked out really well we had a meeting what did she Zoom. respond to that She's like, yeah, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> Either but or. If you met Grace, you would know that it's just that's just Grace all over. And at the time, she had twenty thousand uh, followers on Instagram, two hundred thousand on TikTok. See, now she's got three million on TikTok. She's got about eight hundred thirty. I want to say eight hundred thirty-three thousand on Instagram, and then obviously she's got a YouTube site, and you know she's going down TV. And we sort of started with this strategy of, you know, trying to build up as an influencer. And at the time, she her biggest goal, she wanted to be on Love Island. It was a completely different thing. And we've just grown it and grown it. And I always thought she could be a presenter. And I felt she could go down this different direction. And, I, I you know, I know you said you saw the Talk 20s podcast. I always thought she was very much Amelia Dims and Alison Hammond. If they had a baby, Grace, would that would be Grace. And I think she is so unique in this industry and she's so different and I think she's really opened doors for a lot of other talent to really be themselves because she was she started on the platform where she you know she came on with no makeup and she was authentic herself hung over and showed every single aspect of her life so rawly and I don't think anyone had really done that before we were coming through a stage where everyone would it was pretty pictures and oh, there was so much pressure to have these perfect bodies and you know it she was such a fresh of breath of fresh air which i think is why she's done so so well building up a real authentic following and one that everyone somewhat she's someone everyone loves because they feel they know her and they, they do what you see is what you get with grace and she is as kind and driven and funny in real life as she is on camera so it's 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 I'm very proud of Grace and mm. a, a woman she's also become, not only as a talent, but as a person. Mm. So you've, you've selected her or, you know, people have well, sent... She has to select me too. It's kind of like a partnership. So, But, init- but initially, because the, mm. the approach came from you. I mean, people were sending videos to you and you're like, great, I see this potential, I see this talent. So once she agreed, mm. what did you do then? How did you help to manage her career? So obviously you know, you have the onboarding process, you go through like goals. So with Grace, we, we have like a yearly plan anyway. We always, we always had the end goal. We always knew, we said that from the, from day dot, but they obviously, as she's grown and as she's also grown up, her career goals have changed as, you know, as she's changed. And it's the same, you know, with, with, with your, myself or yourself, you know, the things that you wanted three years, four years ago, probably aren't the exact same as you'd want now. So we meticulously strategize from 12 months, we work it down. So from three, six, 12, so 12 months, that's where we want to be by the end of the year. And by six months in, I expect it to be halfway, at least halfway towards that. And we're, you know, only accepting deals that go towards that. And also authenticity is really important for us. So Grace has to love the brand. Grace has to want to work with them because she feels passionate. So um, I'm trying to think of a good example that I can speak about. <laughs> One thing about you work with this industry, you're in a lot, a lot of embargoes. So there's only so much you can speak about. But actually Channel 4.0 she works with and she did Boss Pitches, which is um, a show she did with Nella Rose. 
And we work really closely with Sinead and Hannah from BBC Studios to build a show that all, with her audience would love and that really could show her side, but also a different side to what she's already put out with her podcast. So it's, and that took us, I think, eight months to get it right. So it's always a case of building, building, and we, we wanted her to have a show. So it was, but if she's going to do a show, what show is it? And, you know, she's a digital first talent. It made sense to be a digital first via Channel 4.0. And then obviously we did Stand Out to Cancer. It was something she was very, very proud of to be a part of. But it threw her out of her comfort zone. She's petrified of heights. And they threw up a bungee swing. Um, and I don't think she was best pleased. But it was incredible TV. And it was incredible for her. Hmm. How do you select talent now? So they have, we have certain values that we look for. Originality and authenticity is such a big part of what we're looking for. Um, someone's really different. We don't like don't like looking for talent who have, that you could say, oh, they're just like that person. You know, I think that's for us is, you know, we are a bit more niche in terms of our talent and how many we take on as well. So our talent managers only have three to five as a maximum per talent manager um, just so they can re like really spend time and really develop and hone in what each talent wants to achieve. And I think for that's something that we found really, really works. You know, you do it's trial and error for everything, but um, usually you can see it. We actually, we do a lot of like research around a talent. We have a lot of meetings around new talent, ones to watch, and we really enjoy that process because sometimes also you'll meet a talent and maybe their goals are different to what you could see and you go, actually, I don't know if actually I'm the best fit, but we work with a lot of talent at other agencies and we get on with so many that we go, actually, maybe you'd fit, really fit with them. And that, that for us is quite important as well, is making sure that all of our goals align. You know, if we want something for you that you probably wouldn't want, then actually that's not going to fit. And there's no right or wrong. It's just what, what we think works. As you're getting bigger, obviously there are influencers, content creators who will be reaching out to you what's the best approach for them to make to get noticed by you? I think it's a case of, well, firstly, actually, do you know how many people email us or send us a message saying, dear, H no, hi, HDL, getting the company name right is pretty important. <laughs> um, the basics. <laughs> we get that on job, uh, job uh, applications too, and I think, oh, it hurts every time. It's only three letters. I wouldn't, you know, and if people know the history of the company, it's actually my surname. So it's like Holland, so H L D, the three key, the three main letters of my surname. Um another thing I think is is like being really clear on like these are your stats. These this is where I would like to go. I think you could really help me and understanding their niche I I love to see. You know, I, sometimes you don't know where you want to be, but you know what you're good at I think it's a really competitive industry at the moment I think you know there's now UGC cre creators you know where they're literally just sort of working with brands and brands are using their content they, this, this and then now there's AI influencers it's very competitive so having a niche is so important just, you know and I really so I actually have a few TikTokers that I watch who really are, they're not kind of talent we that we manage but I find them re I really love um people who uh show what you eat in a day right yeah and um we don't necessarily manage you know a food talent we have foodie holly who's incredible and she's more of a chef uh, but I really love that side of the industry and but it's like only if we think we could be additive to their career that would we retake them on and um so I think for me for us what we're, we're always looking at is who's kind of ahead of the curve, who really sees something different. You know, um, there's some really incredible fitness talent out there who also make you feel that you could do it too. I watch, you know, people running the marathon. I'm like, Jesus, wept, I cannot. And but actually they make it really seem doable. And I love watching those things. I love people who do voiceovers. I think that's really powerful more than just music. It's, it's about how also the content and the quality that they're producing we're in a world now where there's literally 15 year olds and 12 year olds who can create what looks like a professional video it's very competitive but it's incredible I love watching the creativity flow mm. so I think it's all about you know how you present yourself and you know being really honest and also doing your research in the agency just because you've seen it and you've seen that you like the talent that shouldn't be enough you should want to that that talent agency you should look into and go oh I've seen you've done this and you really look like you 
you know, you could help me in this direction because I've seen you do it, mm-hmm. rather than just being like, oh, you manage that person, I love them, like that vibe. Right. So being more precise and doing yeah. the research and having a plan already. I don't, they don't need to have a plan already, but they should have goals. I think it's really important for talent to have goals because a, ta- a manager can't help you unless you know really where you want to go. And I also think we're, it's a weird space right now where everyone wants a manager, but actually sometimes you don't need a manager yet. You wait it out, build your audience, build your community, you know, and it will come at the right time. So, you know, there's always a, that argument actually that someone could get management too early or, you know, management could really has to work over time to really build that talent up because they've taken someone on too early. And it's, you know, it's really everyone's own call, but I think it's really important to understand, you know, when people always say it's important to know when to bow out, it's important to also know when to step in. I think, you know, just because just someone's got 100,000 followers doesn't mean they need a manager until they really are at a point where they're right, right, this is the next step and this, because these are the goals I want to hit and only by having a team around me will I hit those goals. Mm. Have you had a situation where a, the talent wanted something and you were dead against it? Probably. I, I can't think of the top of my head. I think we're quite collaborative. So if it's a no, it's a no. And if if it's something that people aren't, uh, we aren't sure, and we're like, actually, this would be really great for your career. You have a conversation about it. And if it's still a no, it's still a no. You can't just accept what it is. And I think as long as you have a good relationship and people are willing to listen to you out. But I think it probably has happened. It's been for the time manager for about eight years now. So I'm guessing it's been happened somewhere. I just can't recall. Mm. I guess, you know, what I'm looking for is like, you know, someone who has completely different ideas to what you think will be in their benefit. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe maybe you're so closely aligned and we try pick to the be. people so closely aligned to what you're doing that you I kind think, of have the same idea. Yeah, it takes time to get there, though. And I think we as an agency, we've redefined our niche as well. And I think you know, for a long time, I really wanted to be, you know, this massive agency that did have everything. But actually, one of the things that we've really been successful in is by honing in on our niche. And, you know, you can have fingers in lots of pies, but you should really get those fingers done correctly before you start adding to them. So I think that's something that we've really, you know, we almost sort of tightened it up and before we start expanding out. Mm. What do you enjoy about what you do? all of it I love strategizing I love creating decks for brands that is creatively partners talent in a way maybe they can't see it I love working with brands and their teams because you know a lot of them are similar age to me and I was you know you can make friends in the industry this industry is really fun I love going abroad with my talent I love watching what was an idea turn into a reality and it's you know seeing a talent on a billboard trust me there's no other feeling to it because you're like wow like we've done it yeah. seeing them on tv i think i love the hustle that comes with it to get to the end result and then there's the next step when you're always constantly next 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 because that's how just how my brain works i love being someone who could say oh i was the first to do that that's you know the things that drive me but i just i love the fact that talent can start you know as this like I guess like a rosebud and then blossom into a rose I just love that process mm. what's been your proudest moment I've got loads to <laughs> I find it hard uh, have to pick one I'm so proud of what we've done with Grace and my, my partnership with Grace and me and her really really align and she's doing she's doing some really incredible things this year so they will be some of my proudest moments, but I can't speak about them yet. For my personal is I got th- four percent under 30, and I was really proud of that because that was on my goals list for a long time. So that's why I'm with my personal. But also building the agency and seeing my staff really become incredible young women and, you know, grow in their jobs has also be, been incredible. Watching your staff start buying houses based on their, the career that w- was, uh, for me, was just my, something I started in my kitchen is pretty incredible. I think there's quite a lot that I'm very proud of. I just I just never really think about it. I just go next, next, next. Mm. Talking about building your team, talk to me about the moment when you were hiring your first employee, what that was like. Oh, I just, you know what? It was literally one of our talent's friends. And we only, when we started, we had, I think, three talent. Mm-hmm. So he, 
he was like best friends with that talent and she was really bigging him up and he he had some really great connection in the industry so it just sort of made sense so it wasn't really a process I was 24 so I don't think I knew too much I, I, now our hiring process is is great but at the time I think it was very much oh this works and you know he was incredible and he really helped build the build the agency in those early years so I was very lucky but I you know I I try and uh, go. I used to try and go by vibes. <laughs> um, can't do that. Uh, <laughs> I've learned that you have to really, you know. Now it's like we look at experience, we look at those different things. But I think you, when you're starting off, you really have to learn from those mistakes and, but also the things that you've done well. I always trust my gut, especially with hiring. When has it proved you wrong? Loads. <laughs> <laughs> Usually my gut is right and I've gone against it, and then I'm like, damn, it should have listened. Um, there's a couple of talent that I thought we should have signed and I, I maybe thought we didn't move quick enough. Managing talent is fraught with all sorts of issues, as I imagine. Has there been a crisis that you had to manage or something that really went terribly wrong and then you had to fix it? Um, um, probably. I know in terms of anything crisis related that's we would you say it's like publicity side of things and in the early days when we used to manage more reality tv stars you you'd have more of that i think you know it's like any job if things will go wrong i think it's about how you how quickly you can fix them and that's something i think we've become very good at but we have some really great publicity teams mm -hmm. that we work with so we have like emily blair who kind of they're very quick i think as long as you've got a very quick team and you're willing to you know, work alongside, like we work with Bell PR as well, like they, everyone's quick, so that's really great for us. Um, but in terms of anything, there's never really, when you're doing the t like the talent side, I would never really say we've had like a big emergency where we're like, oh my God, it's all hit the fan. It's usually, it's everything's quite fixable. I always say like, unless someone's dead, it's very fixable. You know, that's the worst case scenario. Someone, someone Maybe you're just so died. calm that nothing is the crisis. <laughs> it's not true because I'm actually, I actually wind myself up. And anyone, I'm sure, <laughs> Chloe, you can attest to it. I'm acting like I'm very calm collected. I think every little issue is a, a, a crisis. But I think that's why I get it done quick, fix it quickly. Because I'm always so like, no, I need to fix this now. But I've got a very good team around me um, who help. You know, it's not one person. What One person can run a business. Or a talent, to be honest. It's, 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 it's an army. So, but no, nothing really terrible that I've been like, fuck. Like, it's always been, like, very fixable. Yeah. You, We were talking about hiring your first person that kind of happened because they were close by, and now you have a process. Mm -hmm. How do you look for people for your business now? You know, when we, we, it's always about who's the best candidate. I love looking at experience. I love meeting people and personality. Love hearing their passions. I think for us, that's something that's really important. You know, I love different personalities on the team and different experience. They all add together and bring different things to the table. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Always, always looking at who can see. I like to, I love it when um, we interview people and they love talent who isn't the most obvious on the books or you know they, they're going for talent and I love that that for me is like cool and they're saying well, I can I really can see them doing this and I'm like it's amazing to hear you know if you're going for the biggest talent on your books you're going right okay well that's that's easy to see where they're going because we put them on that trajectory but you know if it's a smaller talent who are we're kind of building up it's it's really interesting to see or if it's maybe not necessarily our talent but like someone who we're like who who do you think we should take on and maybe they thought of someone we wouldn't think of and they've given us all these reasons and going oh, oh my god that's incredible I love I love that side of meeting new people mm. that's quite important for us mm. talk to me about how it works working with brands and figuring out what works for each talent so every talent is different. So obviously you have like a talent who might be a bit more makeup related, fashion, personality. And it's all to do with, you know, where, where do they want to see themselves go? I also think there is a fine line between a really great brand fit and selling a soul. I think you have to really balance that out. You know, what's more important, the money or your 
reputation and where you're building yourself. And I think that for me is something that we constantly look at internally. You know, if you pick the right brand, you know, that money that you declined for the wrong brand will come back tenfold. So I think for us, it's about, right, where, what are your goals? What are the things that you're actually passionate about? What products do you actually use? Where do you see yourself sat? You know, if you're talking about, I'm trying to think who's a great example. Also, like, purpose-led talent. Stormzy's really great in terms of, he's always really purpose-led, like Murky FC with Adidas. That made sense. Things that you go, ah, that makes sense, but I didn't think of it. I love those kind of brand partnerships, and they're the ones that really work. I think that's sort of how we always looking at it. Right, that actually, that's a really perfect fit. Oh, my God, she loves that. That would be really perfect. Rather than, you know, oh, my God, that person's offered this much money. Like, oh, my God. You know, I think that's... But I also do know that is a privilege, um, position to be in so you know smaller agencies maybe not be in that position so I do see both sides of it mm. which is why I was saying to you earlier there is a difference between like an agent and a manager so yeah it's understanding it from a very very deep perspective it's knowing the values where they want to go mm -hmm. what they enjoy and how that fits in it, it's it's you're a matchmaker I guess so. I, th I think also as well, it's like we know what value that talent could bring to the brand and we know what that brand could bring to the talent. And I think mm -hmm. it's having that mutual respect of each other is really important in this industry. It's not mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm this person, so I, you know, I'll, bring, I'll do this for your brand. Yeah. That should never be an attitude. It should always be, you know, I know that I my audience would love this and I know that your audience would love working working with me and what I can bring, you know, in terms of different value. So I think it's very much a case of, you know, putting the two together in a really respectful way, I think, you know, ego kind of has to come out of it. So that for me is really important. And I think that's mm. something we're really great at at HLD. I see parallels between my business, which is executive search. So it is looking for talent for companies. I mean, it's they go and work there full time mm. as opposed to working in a collaborative kind of partnership way. But it's still about making sure that there is a fit. You yeah. know, that's really, really key because, you know, you don't want to place somebody who will only be there for six months or even a year. You really want them to be married to that business. And, yeah. you know, and maybe in your case, it's not necessarily they're working there for, you know, permanently, but you want them to come back knowing that it's achieved exactly what they set out to. Yeah, I do. think... In terms, yeah, in terms of the brand partnership side, for sure, mm -hmm. I think it's really important. Yeah, you know, most of the time, talent would love to work with a brand long term. I think, you know, th things do change. And, you know, sometimes maybe that brand strategy has changed. And, you know, you just work around it and you re-strategize. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like even like in recruitment, for example, you know, when you're partnering a talent like a, like a prospect, I guess, with a brand, it's really important that they work well together, they both believe in each other. It's like it's any job, yeah. I, I think it's just it's a, just a different way the influencer scene is just different. I think, I think people think anyone could do it too, and I'm here to tell you they cannot. It is so hard, it's so hard. I, I, I'm not, I'm very much behind the scenes. I could not make a reel, I could not do any of those things and it's so also it's really scary to put yourself out there the internet is a scary place right now have you tried have you tried to do that or no. it just doesn't even <laughs> enter your mind no i i like doing business related things yeah but no like we um on our tiktok we've done i've done things for our hld tiktok but no not for myself i just can't imagine myself doing it i think i'm quite camera shy in that sense you know my my personal Instagram is my personal Instagram, but I'm not trying to be an influencer. So mm. it's it's different. But I, I really respect everyone, anyone who puts themselves out there. It's scary. It's really scary. I mean, the amount of hate you can you you get is intense. Yeah, I think you, it can be. I think trolling is. It's just always going to be there. When you, when you, someone like the internet, you can have all these anonymous sources, of course. It's scary. I, you know, I think I'd crumble. <laughs> I've had hate before, you know, so it's like, and I'm very much behind the scenes and I sit there and go, like, oh, I don't know how people do this. It's, it's horrible. Mm. It's not nice. So it's like, oof. I've had some exposure to social media myself. Yeah. And it's exactly the reasons why I did not want to be so, f like, forward facing and being in front and being visible and being perceived because there is just this whole segment of humanity that I really struggled to 
kind of understand where these you know people who really just want to tear you down yeah it's it's weird isn't it and it, i do think it, but i do i really live by the quote clean hearts always win and i just i have to believe that and i think it's something that my mor- my morals are so it's so important for my morals and also the people around me that they have the same morals of you know we don't need to tear people down to get where we want to be we can bring each other up and we can help each other and there's enough business in this world and you know and we don't have to be that way i think the trolling thing is weird to me that you would you really hate someone that you don't know so much that you've gone out of your way to say some pretty vicious things so like you know I, I love my some of my talent they handle it really well they just laugh at it because some of it is quite funny like some of the things the insults you sit and go silly but you know some of it is like a bit too close to the cusp and that yeah. you read for you know even there's a few sites like Tattle Life I don't agree with it literally breeds hate and it's you know this world is hard enough as it is I think <laughs> what I've realized about social media is that because when people are visible you know, they are open to receiving all the greatness, but also all of the negativity. Mm. Whereas when you're a consumer with a faceless account who may be having a bad day and you just sort of vent into this vortex of, of, of messages. And I had this comment once from something about what I was saying on, on a podcast and, he was talking about oh look at her you know look at her eyes you know she's you know like I don't know like she's a hate is coming from that and I and or talking about you know being raising kids or whatever and I was like you know what this person's obviously having a really difficult time Mm. so why don't I just be nice instead in the comments instead of responding myself and well I didn't and what was really interesting, then we had a conversation about it. And in the end, I was like, oh, thank you. And I was like, almost just people just want to be seen and heard. Yeah. But the way they go about it is in a negative way. And I think for me, as somebody who is really interested in, in human psychology, mm. I find that was an unexpected understanding of the social media about how mm. the consumers respond and why are they doing the things they're doing anyway. But I also think people should respect the fact that actually, to you know, in some ways, you know, you have to put yourself out there to to get somewhere in this world at the moment, especially the social media dominated side. So, you know, like at the time, I'm like Connor Walker was everywhere, and I really looked up to that, and it didn't really feel like she was getting hate. And I think it really depends what, how you're putting yourself out. But people are always going to hate on things that maybe they can't do themselves, and I think that's something to always think about as well. That sometimes jealousy can breed that and that's why it's gonna be kind to everyone you just don't know what people are going through at any given time and I just know that I personally if I was having a bad day wouldn't necessarily put it on to someone random online um that's just not how it's just not how just, you roll <laughs> just not how I am you know maybe I'll just write in a journal or something <laughs> probably a more I just call my friends and I'm just like babe that's that's my version of therapy I think there's this sense of connection and feeling heard and seen mm. and I think when people are very lonely and they don't have that support network you just kind of go to this sort of social media world yeah. and just sort of spew it for content creators you know wannabe influencers what advice would you give them stay authentic to yourself block out the the noise of anyone telling you, you need to be doing this you need to be doing this um because if you're building yourself up organically anyway, you know what, you eventually know what your audience want, you can feel it, and you can, you know, Grace talks often about how she knows how to make a viral video because she knows what her audience wants. And I think that's really important to really listen to your audience because they're the ones that are going to keep you up there. It's not necessarily, you shouldn't start this industry just to get brand partnerships and, you know, make loads of money. It should always be the back end. You know, when it comes to podcasting, we say the same. If you want to be a podcaster, you know, the, most most podcasts takes a year for it to start really get revenue you know if you're it's once in a blue moon it happens you know there's an ex, there's the exception and there's the rule so you should actually love what you're doing i also think as well sometimes people are too quick to leave their full-time jobs just to say that they're an influencer i think there is a we should normalize that actually you can do two things and um that's quite that, that's something that does scare me a little bit that people put so much pressure on themselves that actually you're creating a pressure that doesn't need to be there because 
it's a marathon not a race hmm. you know we'll get you get there at some point and you know eventually the world starts waking up to you and you start getting noticed and it's a really exciting feeling when you've done it organically but we also are in a, a new world where it's like instant gratification is so important to everybody and I find that that's something that we're always kind of discussing like even down to like you know I need an outfit tomorrow PLT next day delivery you know I get impatient like that so that's someone in their careers I I always have to sit and remind myself I what are we're doing now is something I always wanted and it felt like I didn't do it quick enough and I put a lot of pressure on myself so we're all guilty of it mm-hmm. but I would say just stick to your guns and just do it slowly and you know try not to rush it too much and don't quit your day job <laughs> don't well don't there's no point quitting a day job until you know that actually this is what you want because I think this industry is very competitive so it's you know you've got to really really love it how long does it take to build it so say you know you're starting out you have your job you want to be a creator how long should you give yourself oh that it's hard to say isn't it it's like there's no exact time frame uh everyone's journey is very different so i'd hate to probably put a number out there and then it's like <laughs> bible um I think TikTok is easier to go viral and kind of build that side. Instagram's always been a little bit tougher, but obviously with Reels, I think it's if you understand social media and the algorithms, you know, you can do it within like a year, build yourself a nice following and a good community. But I think it's consistency, really, and I think that's where if your patient runs thin, it's not for you. It's... Um, you know, you always hear about people who bought followers before. That doesn't really happen anymore, I don't think. I think people really understand that how important it is to be organic and build your community, and it's a lot more rewarding. You know, 25,000 followers, You would, if you put them in a stadium, you wouldn't turn your nose up at that. Yeah. So I think, we, like I said, it's that instant gratification of, of a number. But actually, if it's organic, that number, 25,000, put them in one room, that's an incredible amount of people watching what you're up to. And investing in you so it's not something to sneer at Hmm. what's the minimum number I know what you're saying well it's not a number but every brand wants to hear the numbers they want to see the number is it not Not true anymore no it used to be I would say it used to be but now it's like engagement levels you could have some of the million followers if they've got one percent engagement that's not great but if you've got someone with 50,000 followers with 60% engagement you know which one you're picking Mm -hmm. so it's all to do with like the content and the the value that you can bring and how incredible that content is and production value that all comes down to play and looking at your engagement that's why it's important to build an engaged audience because Mm -hmm. that long term it's not like I said it's not necessarily the number of followers but it's how engaged that number is Mm -hmm. how do you measure engagement you can actually measure it on your app usually, uh, but we also have like a platform we use externally where we can see the you know average engagement, how much you're posting. We can also dive into people's stats of like roughly how many, how, what percentage of your audience are single, married, age range. Wow! So it's something that we use like back end, so we can kind of have a look at it ourselves mm. and then figure it out from there. And yeah, it's usually pretty accurate. Mm. So for you to pick somebody to manage as talent what kind of numbers do they need to have we don't look at the numbers like I said we don't we don't, we don't it's, it's but surely do. if somebody comes to you with I don't know a thousand Instagram followers yeah, but that's different because that's not that that I, I, I don't like to put a number on it because mm. I just I just don't necessarily agree with that but if you have a thousand f- followers you know, it's, you know, you're still in the early stages and we spoke earlier about you don't always need a manager straight away. So I think for us, it's very much a case of is there a need? Can we be additive to your career? That's so important. Mm-hmm. Can we add? That has to be the main thing for us. We have to be able to add to what they're doing and be able to help build with them. Mm-hmm. Like I said, it's not a case of us choosing them. It has to be both parties feel like we're a great fit to work together. So for me, that's a really important one not numbers <laughs> it's like it isn't it is. I mean it's it's one way of gauging where yeah, you're at sure. but it's not the only thing no for sure and I think you know say if you have a really talented DJ for example their social platform might not be that high but you can build them with a brand because they've got a name in a different world so it's not just what your social media is saying it's a big part of it but it's you know that's why personal brand is something we really look at as well how your personal brand can take you further than 
a number on a screen. And I think that's really important. Like Peroni could match with a DJ with 20,000 followers because they've got a really big name within that, you know, space. And people know them when they're on a poster, but they might not have a big following. Because mm. not every social media is not for everyone, you yeah. know. And I think that that's something we look at. What's the you mentioned TikTok being a place where you can go viral and grow pretty quickly? Do you have a favorite platform, or do you have a platform that you think actually this is the one that I will put my money on? So I actually really love Facebook still. Um, do that, you? That's, that's just me personally. Oh my, I love Facebook. I have not gone onto Facebook for maybe six no, months. I I am living like an IOP still. I love it. I love Facebook. <laughs> I love seeing what people from my school got up to. Right. I, I love it. I don't uh, see anybody who. I don't see any of my friends. I just see those horrendous videos, or at least that's what oh, I used what to videos? see. You know, the ones that just keep on going forever and ever and ever and never um, have a satisfying... Algorithms. Yes, I mean, that's what it's sending me. And I'm like, what is this? I don't want it. So I'm, I think I really like Instagram and Facebook yeah. as a person. Mm-hmm. But as an agency, we, you know, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat is on the back, on the like on the rise, back, back up. And I remember when Snapchat, when I was younger, it was used for very different things it's used for now. And now it's like creators. A lot of platforms are really, really understanding the value of rewarding creators for being loyal to a platform and giving their all and it's something that snapchat is really great at and they're building out these like different production values of like mini shows you know a lot more like i said this instant gratification thing of like i like watching reels i won't necessarily watch a whole show but i'll watch snippets Mm -hmm. and that's something they've really done really well on that side that's why instagram really good on the reels tiktok on that side and i think that's where their platforms are. But there will be a new platform at some point. And it's all about who can move and adjust quick enough to it. You know, that the people who thought that MySpace would be forever and didn't move to Instagram quick enough. Usually the people who did MySpace and Bebo, that's a bit of an old school, and I, <laughs> I, I came from Bebo. So you go, you know, MySpace and Bebo move quickly onto Instagram. They're the ones who tend to have the bigger following and they just kind of understand it, you know, it's like from the beginning, not necessarily now. Um, they just get it quicker. I th- it's, it's also these new platforms. Remember, um, house party tried to be a thing during uh, lockdown. Do you remember that house party? Yes, you I like think jump so. Jump on, and people could just jump I onto never your did, video. Yeah, that I, I never did it. that. But yeah, I. I was sad when it died. Because <laughs> I really enjoyed it during lockdown. Lockdown mm. was a tough place for us all i was on clubhouse during lockdown oh no i couldn't get into it i like video oh my god i was literally obsessed some people were still on clubhouse and the people like losing sleep it was like Ooh. a proper addiction no i couldn't get in, yeah. i couldn't get on board with it it wasn't my thing <laughs> but like i said i like i like seeing a face mm. so. actually what was really interesting is because it was audio and then you can do it you know you can be in bed you know, wearing a face mask, don't care what you look like, you're just sort of speaking. So there was this certain... me on my days off. <laughs> so that was the appeal of it. But I made some good friends from that, actually. That's nice. I yeah. like that. I yeah. think, you know, social media the right way can really bring people together. It can be a really powerful tool, you know, yeah. to raise awareness for different things. And I, I think there is so much power in social media and online. But, you know, where there is good, there is always bad. And it's like, you know you've got to kind of figure out which is which side you're going to let win. And mm. I think, I, you know, like I said, it doesn't scare you, I guess. That's just, you know, it's what I look at. What's the future of digital influences, social media? Where do you see this all going? Scarily enough, I think AI will have a big impact on the market and the industry. And I think that's petrifying a little bit. Mm. In but, what way? Because I think, you know, you're talking about artificial intelligence, right? You're talking about potentially like, you know, there's AI models now, AI influencers. They've just saw this thing about AI influencer awards and like they look very realistic. There's AI influencers now who can quite literally build a huge audience and brands are paying them to do certain things. I think that's scary. You're taking real people out of jobs. Mm -hmm. I think you're letting... AI too much into the real life world. You never want to get to a point where you don't know the difference. I think that's a little bit scary. But I also think using the, like I said, you know, if you, if you can use it for good, power for good, then great. But if you use it for bad, it's like anything. If you use the internet for bad, it's, it's terrible. But if you use the internet for good, you can do, you can achieve some incredible results. Mm. And I think the same with AI. But I think we will go down a bit more that route. See, sub- subscription platforms have always kind of been on the rise. You know, even Instagram now have a subscribe um part i think 
there'll probably be a new platform at some point. And I, I think you're just going to see content get more and more creative and more, you know, the production value now of YouTubes are in somewhat like TV shows. It's incredible to see. So I think we're just going to see that grow. But every year I hear, you know, the downfall of social media, the downfall of influencers. Every year the value of social media marketing and digital marketing increases. Mm -hmm. So I think you're just going to see it continue to increase. It's an incredible industry. So, you know, it's just about honing in. Hmm. And what's the future look like for you and your business? Oh, darling. Um, we're venturing out into different territories, which is really exciting for us. Um, we started venturing out into LA this year. Uh, so we've been out a few times and, um, you know, we've got some uh, American-based talent. Um, so that's really exciting for us. Um, we're working on different projects and we're always looking at what is the, what is the, the future of this industry and how do we stay one step ahead and how do our talent stay one step ahead? So, you know, a big part of that is always being really hot and heavy on our research and keeping up date with trends. So, you know, expanding out as well, you know, we do different growth stages and bringing different people into the team. So it's, it's an exciting time for us. I think we're still very much in the early stages of how, how mm. far we could really go. Well, you moved to LA. I couldn't live out there. No? I just couldn't. It's just such a different... So I've got uh, an American next to me. Um, but we've spoken about it before. It's it's a different kind of world out there. And I really like my home comforts. And, you know, I love being out there. But it's, it's very intense. And I think, you know, they move very quickly, which I love. And I love that part. I think it's, um, it's a very different way of living. And also, I feel like my, the humour in England is, like, a little bit more of me. Yeah. I, I, like, I, like, I like a London. I like a... I like being surrounded by the hustle and bustle of London. So I don't think mm. I could li ever live there, no. Mm. But, you know, also it's a bit hot for me. Do you know what I mean? I've got ginger I skin. I completely agree I with you on that. I burned to a cinder. <laughs> I literally burned to a cinder. So even when I was like, yeah. oh, I'm very distressed out here. I like um, I like the weather in England. It's, it's I like the weather in England. No, <laughs> I like it. Everyone's going like, oh, we didn't have a summer. I was like, I really enjoy that. No, it's I like mild. Luke warm. Luke warm is good yes. for me. I'm like this. Yes. And everyone's like moaning, like 30 degrees the other day in London. Oh my God, it was horrible. I can't and if survive. You get a tube, trust me, you, <laughs> no. ain't, you ain't loving that weather. The tube, that's like 40 degrees down there. I'm like, oh, I can't take it. I feel claustrophobic. <laughs> and like, it's, it's horrible. So, you know, a good 20 degrees is fine for me. 18 to 20. My perfect temperature, I think, is like, yeah, eight, yes. 18 to 20. 18 to 21. Oof. Just gone one above. There 21 go. is a good temperature because it's warm enough that you don't need a jacket, like a coat, but you can still wear like a light blazer. So this is and if it's sunny, then you can, you can, you know, mm. take that off and that's perfect. This is giving miscongeniality. It's like, which was a perfect date, July 4th. Because, was it July 4th? She says, she's like, it's not too hot, not too hot, it's not too cold. Just need a light jacket. That's what that was doing. Yeah, I loved it. I'm going to look that up because no, that's, really like, good. To, like, that's totally like me. No, it was really good. I enjoyed that. What seems impossible to you now, but should you achieve it, will change the course of your business? Oof. I don't know. I don't think I've ever been asked that before, to be fair. Um, I think everything... I don't actually believe that anything is impossible to achieve. That's the one thing I think I've learned is that anything you put your mind to, you can get there. I think, you know, I'd love to get to the Chris Jenner level, you know, having talent that, on that large scale and working with huge designer brands on massive campaigns, I think, you know, and like global TV shows. And it always can always feel a bit impossible, but I think it's doable. I think it's about, like I said, your relationship with your talent growing together and really working hard and, you know, having... I think it's, that's why I think it's really important to, you know, really trust your management and, you know, work with them because that's how you're going to get to those stages. I think I'd love to one day take, like, dominate America and have some huge talent out there. I think America is a really exciting place. New York and LA are really at the hubs. I also really want to go to Nashville. Um, but that's just a personal note. I just feel like, feel like they'd really like me there. <laughs> I think so too. Not that I've ever been there. I've never been, but apparently it's, like, life-changing. I don't know. I could see myself as a cowgirl. Um, <laughs> I, th I think that's, yeah, taking, like, doing well in America always feels impossible. Mm. Taking over different territories feels always really hard until you've done it. But you go, you know, 
But once you do it, I think people think it's easy because you know you can replicate something. It's, it's not. It's a different. It's like when I say culture, it's like a different way of living. People have different sets of humours, different ways of impressing people, different work ethics. It's a different. It's a completely different way. Mm-hmm. You know, um, like our, um, our publicity team for HLD, there are Americans who've come to the UK. So you know, we've learned a lot from them too, and it's really. Um, it's different. Yeah, it is different. But, you know, that's what it is. It's also, everyone's really well connected to each other in America. So you might have all those connections here in London and the UK, but actually then you've got to take that to the US where you know no one and it might, it, you know, you've got doors shut in your face again. It feels like you're starting fresh. Starting, it feels like when you first start the business. It's, so that that's always feels impossible. What do you find impossible that you think if you achieved it, you've really made it? You know what? I ask this question to everyone, but I never ask it to myself. Well, I'm asking you. <laughs> I go through phases when I think, oh, that's just like it, it's such a big thing to do. I don't know how that's going to work. But for me, if I can bring this podcast to a live audience, oh, I love that. That's not just going and sitting down and kind of being a passive participant. So you're just there observing, but something that's a lot more experiential where you really connecting with the people around you not just sitting in your own little silo because I know especially like Brits are kind of like a little bit reserved Mm. and you know you go to an event and yeah you'll you'll ask somebody or what do you do but you never really feel like you're connecting that that much Mm -hmm. for me like that sense of connection is really really important so it feels impossible to bring the idea I have in my head to life but if I can achieve that that would literally be like my dream I love that. I think yeah. actually podcasts, there's, it, it, podcast talent, like the new rock stars, like Grace has done some incredible things with Saving Grace. I watched that, that I went across cross tour with her and it was incredible. Like it was like a buzz like no other. Like she sold out um, both Palladium dates within like a couple, like five minutes or something like that. But the whole tour was sold out, 15 and a half thousand tickets, 16,000 tickets in 45 minutes. Wow. It's crazy. And then you've got someone like Shits and Gigs and they sold out the O2. Like that's, that's like rappers do that. Drake yeah. does that. Like these podcasters are the new, the new big talent. I think mm. there's some really exciting podcasters. We've got Sister in the City. They're doing incredible things. They're so funny. Obviously, Saving Grace, Amy Charlie's is their private stories. You know, you're watching this audience build. It's incredible, incredible to see. So I think, like I said, it's always one you have to be patient with it with podcasting. But it's definitely achievable. You've got it in the bag, girl. <laughs> You've got it. Well, I love your energy. I love your positivity and encouragement. And I feel like everybody who's working with you is super lucky to have you. Because you just bring this, you know, this energy of like, can do. We're going to make it happen. So thank you so much for coming thank on the show. Thank you for having me. This has been really fun. Oh, thank you. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. If you love listening to these inspiring leadership stories from all walks of life and would like to support our show, the best thing you can do is to subscribe or follow wherever you are listening. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next episode.